The title of the message that, uh, that I'm bringing here this morning, as I said, I pray that it will enable you in a new way. The title is Weaponizing Your Words. It's related to spiritual warfare and I was taken to a verse in Isaiah chapter 49, verse 2. And if you want to take time to open your Bibles, you open your Bible app, please do that. This is going to be a short message, but I want it to be very, very clear what and what, where this is coming from as far as weaponizing your words. Our words have significant power especially if you are a born again believer because the power of your words can make the difference between death or life just as the word says in Proverbs 18 but the verse that I want to bring up is Isaiah 49 and verse 2 and let me read it to you It says, and he has made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand has he hid me and made me a polished shaft. In his quiver has he hid me. There's so much going on in that verse. So much. But what I feel is important for us now in this short time that we have is to understand the power of our words and how we must use them in daily spiritual warfare. You see, it goes on and says, not only has the Lord made our mouth, okay, spoken word not only has he made my mouth like a sharp sword but it also gives us the confidence that with that ability and enabling of that word of God in your mouth that he has made you like a polished shaft. A shaft, if you've ever seen fine machinery or whatever, you can take a rod, you can take a pipe, and it can either be rusted and it has edges, and you know how things, if it's sat outside or anything, it's just a rough piece of steel or... or, uh, you know, it's not really very attractive and it's not going to be very easy to even handle. If you pick it up, there could be burrs on it and it's just not machined the way God is talking about here in this verse. Because he said, I will hide you, I will hide you, I will hide your words in the shadow of my hand, and I'll make you like a polished shaft, which is smooth. And on an arrow, this is very important, an arrow that you will find that will glide and go through the air with minimal resistance is going to be one that is very, very highly polished and smooth. Am I right? If it were something with weight and burrs and rough, every bit of wind is going to catch it and throw it off, and it's never going to find its mark. So this is the symbolism that the Lord is using in this verse here, is I have put my word into you. And he said, and he's, able to make our mouth 
like a sharp sword that is hidden in that shadow of his hands that's like a polished, smooth, finely tuned shaft and in his quiver has he hid me. It's almost like it's a secret weapon. It's like, don't, don't mess with me because in my quiver, in my basket of, of things, I have the word of the Lord that has been enabled in my life. Amen? So I want us to understand that part of it, that this is where God is taking us here, because in Hebrews 4 and 12, it says that the Word of God is quick, and it is powerful, and it is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing goes through, even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Amen? It also says in Psalm 144, verses 1 and 2, it said, Blessed be the Lord my strength, which teaches my hands to war and my fingers to fight my goodness and my fortress my high tower my deliverer my shield and he in whom i trust who subdueth my people under me and then verse 3 that follows in psalm 144 says this lord what is man that thou takes knowledge of him or the son of man that thou makest account of him? He's saying, my God who has enabled me, who has made the words of my mouth to be sharp like a sword, who has given me the ability to, you know, to... Uh, be my strength to who teaches me and my hands to war. All of that. You're my goodness. You're my fortress. You're my shield. You're my buckler. You're everything to me. And then it comes to that verse 3 and it says, Lord, who am I? What is man that you would even take notice of him. Well, we know that God values each and every one of us, and he has a very specific purpose in even making you. And that is truly where we can begin to understand how absolutely wonderful and good our God is and how much he wants us to understand that we have power through him through our words we have been enabled here and in order to understand even the why of spiritual warfare and why there would be a battle or things that we have to contend with the why of that spiritual warfare comes from understanding just a little bit about the beginning of time when God made a very highly favored angel called Lucifer. Okay, go with me to Ezekiel 28. We're going to read just a couple of verses here not going to expound uh, too much on this, but in verse 12 through 15, and then again in verse 17, Ezekiel 28. It's speaking of at the beginning of Ezekiel 28, and it's addressed to the prince of Tyre. And in 
this beginning part of Ezekiel 28 is addressing a specific person or a king or to a, uh, a prince, and it's delivering a rebuke. But then when it begins in verse 12, it changes who it's being addressed to, and it says, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus. We've changed who this is being directed to or what it's about. And it says, And say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. He's speaking of this angel. Thou art the anointed cherub. A cherub is one of the highest, most powerful angels that are ne next to the throne there. And I have set thee so. Thou was upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till 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 iniquity was found in thee. Verse 17, thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. You see, Lucifer wanted to take the glory that rightfully belongs to God alone. But God says he will not share his glory with anyone. So Lucifer became Satan, which Lucifer in the word means the bright one. It's Satan means the adversary. He became Satan, and he planned a rebellion. We read one-third of the angels bought into Satan's lies and joined in his revolt against God. That's why we need to be spiritually keen and discerning and have spiritual garments on to do warfare because the adversary who because of pride because there was the iniquity found in him he is now as the word describes him as a roaring lion roaming to and fro, seeking, if possible, whom he may devour. So we have to have our guard up. We have to have that sharp sword. We have to have our words weaponized. Okay? Go to the next screen here for me. Because we know the familiar verse, where this logically would take us, Ephesians chapter 6, and in verse 10 is where we'll begin, where Paul exhorts the Ephesians in this letter here by the Spirit, and he says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against 
principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. So he gives instructions very specifically, beginning in verse 14. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take note of that word, above all, okay, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Hallelujah. Here's the promise. Read it again. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you will be able to quench, extinguish, put them out, every fiery dart of the wicked one, the adversary, Satan, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Well, we just read, said that there are six things that we need to be prepared for if we're going to do spiritual warfare. He talked about the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, talked about the shoes of peace. He also talked about a shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit. And we've got to be able to stand firm in everything that God has given to us. And we will see the victory manifested in our life. How do I know that? Why can I say that? Because His Word just said it. You will be able to. He has put His Word into your mouth like a sharp sword. He's already given you everything you need to do. So each day, we need to put on that whole armor of God. Those six things that we just said, I want you to note that there's basically two categories of weaponry, of that armor. That first category was the first three pieces of the armor. And it begins with the word having. Take you back to verse verse, uh, 14 of Ephesians 6. Okay? Three things, three pieces of the armor are saying these are things you have. Having. These are things that are almost like it's a permanent part. They're a part of you always there. It says, having, verse 14, your loins girt about with truth, the truth, the belt, okay? And having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet. So you've got the breastplate. You've got that, that, uh, that belt and you've got the shoes. These are things that you have as a born-again Christian, as a believer. The other category is where it says, and then take up. It's an action that needs to be manifested in our lives. Continuing on in verse 16, it says, above all, taking. We've got to take the shield of faith. Take the helmet of salvation, read in verse 17, and the sword of the Spirit, 
which is the Word of God. So both in what we have been equipped with, having, and what we take is what will complete that entire army, armor. I want to take us to the next screen here because it's a little bit of a, a rabbit hole. <laughs> but it brings the point out of a picture that I had seen some place came up on a reel that goes through here. And it was an interesting picture because it was titled The Chess Players. And I looked at it and I thought, this is weird. There's some guy playing chess with the devil. Okay? But there's a story behind it. I want you to just understand this story because to me it gives us yet again the enabling encouragement that God is not done and that there is another move just like what you're seeing here. In this picture, this is an actual painting and it was hanging, the story goes, in a gallery in London. It, uh, it shows on the one side of the chess board a symbol of the devil, kind of laughing, kind of mocking, and his hand is poised to, to uh, make the next move. On the other side of that board is this young man that obviously is perplexed sweating it out, not sure, kind of getting scared that this guy might have me here. But the story is that one day a chess champion came into that gallery. And the story relates that this chess champion stood in front of this painting for a very, very long time hours. And just before the gallery closed, the story goes that he let out a loud scream and he said, I've got it. You have one more move. You don't have to lose. What this champion had done is he studied that board, and I don't know if this is the exact board or how it was. If you're a chess player, I, I wouldn't know, okay? But the point is that the devil will try to make you think that I've got you. I've finished you now. But if we are keen to the Spirit of God and allow God to do a work in us, there's always going to be another move. What this chess champion had done was he discovered that there was another move. He found a way not only that that young man on the other side of the board could avoid and escape checkmate, but he was able to, with just a couple of moves strategically, he could deliver checkmate on the devil. And maybe you've been in that position. Maybe you feel you are in that position where it looks like the devil has won that chess game for your life, for your family, for your job, for your health, any other area. But what I bring this picture up for is to get us to remember that we have a champion, Jesus Christ, who will make 
the last move on the devil. Can I get an amen? amen? Through Jesus Christ, your victory, my victory over Satan has already been secured. He paid a price so that we could deliver checkmate on the enemy. Jesus Christ does know the next move that we need to make. And that's why I bring this up here into this uh, part of the uh, message, is as we dig into God's Word, we can develop a strategy. We can study the board, study the Word, so that we know what we need to do to make effectual spiritual warfare. You know, that reminds me of another example in God's Word. 1 Samuel 17 talks about a very familiar story of David and Goliath. Here's a young shepherd boy that goes out to the battlefield and you're seeing a young man slay a giant with a stone. Prior to that happening, though, we read in verses 38 through 40 of 1 Samuel 17, it says that Saul armed David with his armor. And he put a helmet of brass upon his head. Also, he was armed with a coat of mail. David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go. He tried to go, okay? And David said unto uh, Saul, he said, I can't go with these, for I have not proved them. Did you catch that? I haven't proved them. And David put them off him. And he took his staff in his hand, chose him five smooth stones out of the brook, put them in a shepherd's bag. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. There's so much so much vision right there. There's so much happening right there. You know, it says back in 1 Samuel 10 that when Saul was chosen to be king, he was, he was a large guy. He was, you know, significantly, he was... He was buff, okay? So it would have been pretty obvious that David, who was, from what we know, it wasn't like, you know, this six foot five, you know, fit, you know, guy that uh, everybody envisions that's what I'd like to be or do, okay? He was just a shepherd boy. He was fair, it says, but there was nothing special about that was noted about his physical abilities. Saul, on the other hand, was a big old dude. Putting that armor on him, David was smart. He said, I can't. I haven't proved these things. What I have proved is out in the field. What I have and what I do know is what I have in my heart. And what I heard is that I heard a Philistine, an enemy of the Lord, mocking my God. And what I know, and what I have proved is that's not going to continue. 
that's not going to happen in my watch. And so he put off that armor, that earthly armor, what was good for Saul, it's what took care of him, and he said, here's what I will take up, because what I've proved is God is faithful in my life. When there was a lion that came against the sheep that I was put in charge of, he says, yeah, I took after him. I, I killed it. You say, well, how can that happen? God's word is true. And I believe that God would enable a man, a physical man like you and I, to do whatever the Lord has for us to do. A mighty, miraculous feat, why not? David had proved even when a bear came in, how do you fight against a bear? I don't know. My God said, I will empower you, and I give you power over all of the enemy. That is the above all that we take. That above all, take the shield of faith. Take it up and say, my God, I don't know how this is going to work out, but I know this. I've proven you in the past, and I'm going to see you come through again because you promised me. You said you'd never leave me alone. You said you'd be with me. You said you would never, ever leave me vulnerable. And that's why we can thank God for every part of his word and what he shows us in victories like this because this is where David in his heart knew that he was able to take a simple stone something that God had made from the earth pull it out of a shepherd's bag and put it into the motion of that God was going to put behind it and slay a giant. Didn't seem at all like that would be possible. But God. But God. And the giant fell. And his head was taken. And it wasn't even with a sword that David had because he didn't have one. He took the enemy's sword he took the judgment that the enemy thought and had intended for David. What he thought was going to be for his demise, for his murder, God used it and said, huh, God is true. God is faithful. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 10 and 3 says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Casting down imaginations. What is that? Listening to the voice of the enemy in your mind. Casting down imaginations, saying, devil, I will only listen to my God. Just like Jesus said, he did. I only do. I only hear what my, I see my Father doing. Amen? Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Can I get an amen? 1 Corinthians 6 and 4 says, But in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings. A lot of stuff going on right there. Okay? 
by pureness, by knowledge, by long-suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love in vain, by the, sword, by the word of truth, by the power of God. Paul is giving rapid-fire details here. By the armor of righteousness, on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well-known, as dying, and behold, we live as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. Are you hearing what we just quickly said in those verses? Paul said it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what it is that we are facing. We have been equipped. And by the words of our mouth, we can take every part of the armor of God and put it into action. Amen? Last screen. Mike, come on up. Again, I'll put this verse out every week because I love it. Because it has been a life verse to me. It's been a promise that I will always Hold to Isaiah 54 and 17. I wish that we could read it this morning with as much understanding as we can get out of it. It begins and it says, No weapon that is formed against you. That can be words. It can be an action, it can be a gun, it can be anything at all that is meant to destroy you, right? No weapon that is formed against you, what? Shall prosper. Not going not gonna to work. Every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. You, you see, at the beginning of this message, we read from Isaiah 49 that said, and he has made my mouth like a sharp sword. Here in Isaiah 54, a few chapters following it there, he said, Every tongue that rises against you. Who's going to rise against you in judgment? Well, it can be a person. But it's a person working through the deceit of the enemy. The enemy can come against you. That can be a tongue. But just understand anything that is not the voice of the Lord is one that we're going to put up our hand and say, I'm going to hear what the Lord has to say today. No weapon that's formed against me will prosper. Every tongue that rises against thee in judgment you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. This is my heritage. What if we'd personalize that? This is my heritage. See, I've been given certain rights because I'm a son of God Almighty. Jesus Christ said I'm a son. No one can take that from me. No one can take that from you. You see, I've, I've got certain rights. Not bragging. Not bragging. I just have them. This is my heritage as a servant of the Lord. This is what you have been enabled with. And their righteousness, says the Lord, is of me. Yeah. 
so much more. But I recall the verses that we can read in Zechariah chapter 4, where he says, all of this isn't going to happen by your might. Not by might, not by power. So how? By my spirit, saith the Lord. God's Word is pretty simple, really. It is. If we would take it and let the Spirit of the Lord write it on the tables of our heart, we're going to see great things happen. We're going to see the feats of David slaying giants happen in our life. But we've got to take every thought captive. We've got to take every part of the armor that God has enabled and given to us, equipped us with, and use them. Let the Word of God dwell in you richly because he has truly given us all things that pertain to life and to godliness. Why? Because he will use each one of us. He will use man to accomplish his work in this earth. You see, Lucifer at the beginning, we read it, was amazing, had to have been totally a knockout angel. But he fell. He fell. He just thought, thought way too much of himself. And he became the enemy of God and as such the enemy of each one of us. We have been enabled. Let's stand to our feet. Lord, I'm just going to pray a very simple prayer that you would take your word and write it on the tables of our heart. Take your word, Lord, and give us peace that you are walking with us, that you will never leave us alone, and that we have been empowered by the grace of God through his mercy, through his love, we have been given all things. And that is truly why we can pray from victory rather than for victory. Does that make sense? We are enabled to pray a blessing upon each one of us here this day from victory because our God is that good. Jesus Christ is that wonderful. Amen? So let's go forth in that power.